Welcome to this study of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 through 16. This is a pretty difficult study because it's very controversial, and because of that alone, it warrants our consideration today. There are really four different interpretations of these verses, and so I'll just lay them out there for you right out of the bat. Uh, the first one is that what Paul says here is really just culturally relative, and you can throw it out the window because it was just referring to local customs of the first century, and we don't have to do them anymore. The second view is that when Paul says a woman is supposed to have a covering on her head, he's talking about an artificial veil or kind of like a handkerchief that she would put on her head during worship uh, so that her prayers can be heard. The third interpretation is she has to have long hair, uh, but it can be cut as long as it remains long, right? That's the third view. And then the fourth view is that a woman is supposed to have long, uncut hair, or as Paul calls it, hair that keeps on growing long. And the man is supposed to have his hair actually cut. That's the view that I'm going to present to you and I'm going to be advocating for. I'll just tell you that up front. And I'll try to be fair as I do this. There are four goals that I want to keep in the front of our mind as we go through this. And they are conciseness. I want to try to be answer as quickly uh, as I can without getting too wordy. The second thing is to be comprehensive as much as we possibly can. So there are 10 questions to try to capture the 10 most frequently asked questions on these set of verses. We also want to not be deceitful and be completely honest and finally be faithful to the Word of God. Teach only what it teaches. If it says something that we don't like, well, it's the Word of God and we have to respect it. So the format for this video will be going in a question and, form, uh, question and answer format where I'll present a frequently asked question on the subject and then we'll go to giving a scriptural answer to it. You may not agree with everything I say, at least off the bat, but please consider that I will give scripture for everything. We'll try to be, again, logical and truthful. So let's go ahead and get started with the first question. Here we go. Question one. Is Paul's teaching about head coverings in 1 Corinthians 11, 2 through 16 a cultural issue? It's no longer applicable, right? Many countercultural teachings in scripture are freely labeled as out of date, irrelevant, limited to the first century, culturally relative. There's no real standard given to determine when Paul or any of the other New Testament writers teach something that's quote-unquote limited to the first century. However, one thing we can trust in an ever-changing world is the unchanging Word of God. Isaiah says as much. He says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of God stands forever. It seems Paul combated the same type of people in his day. People that wanted to write off these sensitive issues. In no other place does he put a stamp of authority on his teachings as he does when writing about men and women's roles in the church, though. After commanding that women are to remain silent in the assemblies of the church, he states, If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of God. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37. He does something quite similar at 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 16. But if anyone wants to argue about this, we have no other custom nor do the churches of God. This verse is made simple by reading its parallel verse in verse 2. The Holy Spirit would not waste precious time in Scripture to detail something that's a non-issue. And so to sum up, the answer is no. Paul's teachings in 1 Corinthians 11, 2-16 are not culturally relative or to be left up to the conscience and opinions of each individual. Question 2. When Paul says that a woman is not supposed to pray or prophesy, with her head uncovered in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 5, is he saying that a woman must wear a cloth, veil, hat, or something similar on her head when worshiping? 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 5 says, But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. It's commonly taught in commentaries of verses 5 and 6 that when Paul says let her be covered, he's referring to an artificial covering placed on the head of a woman during worship. This can't be the intention of this phrase for two reasons. First, while many commentaries insinuate that the word veil is in the text, it's nowhere to be found. Here's what James Burton Coffin says in his commentary on 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 5. To suppose that Paul here meant mantle or veil or any such thing is to import into this text what is not in it. We have seen that he was speaking of hair in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 4, and that is exactly what he is speaking of here. Second, Many, many questions about Scripture can be solved by a simple word of wisdom. Keep on reading. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 2 through 16, 
is a unit or a block of teaching. Within this unit of teaching, later verses can help explain earlier verses. The following outline of 1 Corinthians 11 verses 2 through 16 should help identify parallels within the unit, and these parallels will help clarify confusing words and phrases. Notice that verse 5 is parallel to verse 15. In verse 5, we learn that a woman should have some kind of covering on her head when she prays or prophesies. When we keep on reading, we learn that the specific covering God has in mind is the natural physical hair on her head. It says in verse 15, But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. God has given every woman a covering. Hair. Therefore, she does not need to go to Dollar General and buy a handkerchief to place on her head during worship. At the same time, a woman can affect her hair covering in such a way that it's deemed inadequate by God. This will be revealed in the following questions and answers. Question 3. Is it okay for a woman to trim her hair as long as it remains long? 1 Corinthians 11 verses 14 through 15 say, Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. This question is often asked due to the common English translations of the phrase, has long hair. From this rendering, it is sensible to ask what long hair means. Is 12 inches considered long? How about waist length hair? Here are a few observations that hopefully make simple what Paul meant by long hair. First, translating from Greek to English can present difficulties. Paul wrote 1 Corinthians originally in Greek, and it was translated into English for the first time by William Tyndale in the 1500s. Even then, the English language has changed tremendously in the last 500 years, and new translations of the Bible continue to be produced every decade to keep the Bible's language current and understandable. Perhaps you can see how this might make translating 1 Corinthians 11 into English while maintaining the intended meaning of Paul a difficult task. Second, the phrase has long hair in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 14 is actually one single word in the Greek. That's right, three English words for one Greek word, komao. Again, this makes the translation difficult. Third, the Greek word translated has long hair, komao, is a verb rather than a noun. Verbs express action, something you do. Nouns express persons, place, things, or ideas. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 14, Paul is talking about what the man does with the hair on his head. And in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 15, he is talking about what the woman does with the hair on her head. Man is not supposed to let his hair grow, while a woman is supposed to let her hair grow. If the woman lets the hair grow like she is supposed to, she will naturally have long hair. Thus, almost all Bible translations say, has long hair. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 14, as this is the result of letting the hair grow, usually. Fourth, the exact phrasing of the word komao in 1 Corinthians 11 verses 14 to 15 conveys ongoing action. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 15, if it was translated as literally as possible, it would say, But if a woman keeps on growing the hair long, it is a glory to her. One Greek dictionary makes the definition of komao as simple as possible for translating into other languages. It says, In a number of languages, it may be necessary to translate komao as to let one's hair grow long or not to cut one's hair. Laonida's Greek English lexicon of the New Testament. So in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 14, the man is told to get regular haircuts and the woman is told to refrain from getting haircuts. By way of example, my lawn borders a hayfield. Throughout the spring, summer, and fall, I cut my lawn once a week. However, during that same time, the hayfield never gets cut until harvest when it's buzzed, you might say. Paul is basically saying the man is the lawn and the woman is the hayfield. This analogy also helps explain what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 6, For if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or shaved, let her be covered. Certainly the man who owns the hay field would be upset if he came to harvest the hay and saw it had been trimmed. He might say, if you're going to trim it, you might as well cut it right down to the nub. I believe this captures Paul's thrust in verse 6. Fifth, there is no magic ruler to define when a woman's hair is long enough. Those who say a woman can trim her hair as long as it remains long 
have never been able to define what is long hair. A typical response to this problem goes something like, well, God will have to be the judge of that, insinuating it's up to the woman's decision as to how long her hair must remain. In turn, I would ask, why would God spend 16 verses instructing men and women how to care for the hair on their head and leave them with no clue as to how long is long, especially if their prayers depend on this matter? See 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 14. That just doesn't seem to be logical. Question 4. If Paul is saying a woman must have a covering on her head when she prays, verse 5, and the covering is her natural hair, then what about women who don't have long hair because they cut it off or lost it to chemotherapy? Will their prayers not be heard according to verse 13? This would be a good place to review points 3 and 4 from the previous question. There you'll learn and you'll remember that when it says has long hair, that's not something that the woman possesses. That's something that she does. It's a verb of action. According to the words of Paul, when a woman keeps on letting her hair grow, that is what is meant by has long hair. A cancer patient who has had chemotherapy, she's lost all of her hair. That's not normative. No, that's, a, that's an exception to the rule. In Africa, on the other hand, women in that culture naturally have difficulty growing their hair past their shoulder length sometimes. But either way, whether it's due to chemotherapy or whether it's due to uh, genetics, if a woman is allowing her hair to grow uh, to whatever length it would naturally grow to, that is glorifying God. That is having long hair according to God. The woman who's cut her hair, she has to realize what she's done, confess of her sin, repent of it, and get forgiveness for that, and then she keeps on letting her hair grow from that point unhindered. God's willingness to hear a woman's prayer has nothing to do with how much hair she possesses, whether that be a lot or whether that be a little, but rather what she does with the hair that she does have. And so the question is then, will she keep on letting the hair grow or will she keep on cutting it? That's the question that needs to be answered in relation to will God hear a prayer or not. Question 5. If a woman must keep on letting her hair grow, then how long can a man's hair get before he needs to get a haircut? This is a good question, and it's answered by Paul in verse 4. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 4 says, Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. The phrase having his head covered comes from two Greek words which literally mean to hang down from the head. This isn't a magic ruler, but neither does it leave the individual up to his opinion. Paul later says, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him? It's not unreasonable to state that nature tells us what to hang down from the head means. Our culture has made long hair on men popular today. Long hairstyles on men range from the hipster man bun to Bob Marley's dreadlocks to the redneck mullet. Natural observation tells any onlooker that these hair lengths are unnatural on men and qualify as hanging from the head. Coincidentally, this Greek phrase is only used of the man in 1 Corinthians verse 11. Question 6. Is the praying and prophesying in 1 Corinthians 11 verses 2 through 16 referring to public praying and teaching and worship only? Many writers isolate the head covering commands of 1 Corinthians 11 verses 2 through 16 strictly to assemblies of worship. However, the motivation for doing this is the same motivation that would restrict this teaching about head coverings to simply a first century custom no longer to be followed. Some general references are made to early Greek and Jewish customs wherein women wore veils in worship and men did not. However, rarely is direct evidence cited for this by any author, and whenever evidence is cited, it is far from what we would call overwhelming. Even if overwhelming evidence were given for such a custom in first century worship, there is nothing in Paul's words where he appeals to any local customs. Rather, the reasons for his teachings are grounded in the God-ordained chain of authority which goes back to creation. You can see verses 3 and verses 7 through 12 for this. In verse 3, Paul says, But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Furthermore, putting... First century worship customs aside, there is nothing within the immediate context that would warrant restricting the head coverings to worship only. In fact, since women are forbidden to speak in the assemblies of the church, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 34, it makes very little sense why Paul would tell the woman to have a covering on her head when teaching, or as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11 and 5, prophesying. And why would Paul go on to say in the very next section of teaching on the Lord's Supper, 
for first of all, when you come together as a church. He says that in verse 18. Why would Paul say this in verse 18 if the assembly of the church was already the focus of discussion in the first 16 verses? If the woman's covering is uncut hair, as we have proven in the questions leading up to now, then the question, do these verses pertain only to worship, it becomes pointless. In order to have uncut hair in worship, she would have to have uncut hair all day, every day. The same goes for the man and his cut hair. He must remain uncovered at all times. Question 7. If Paul is teaching that men must have cut hair and women must have uncut hair, then all the Greek English experts are either wrong or dishonest. True or false? This statement is usually made by those who believe Paul simply requires women to have long hair as opposed to uncut hair. They read the definition of the Greek word komao, translated has long hair, in 1 Corinthians 11 verses 14 through 15, placing emphasis on the word long in these definitions. Here's an example of the Greek word's definition as given by three different Greek scholars. Thayer's Greek English lexicon says, to let the hair grow, have long hair. Art and Gingrich say, to let one's hair grow long. W.E. Vine says, to let the hair grow long, to wear long hair. Again, emphasis is placed on the word long in these definitions by this interpretation. Why is emphasis given to this part of the definition? The answer is there's not a good reason. As was made clear in the answer to the question three above, long hair, which is an adjective plus a noun, is what results from continuing to grow the hair long, a verb, which was the word kamao. The following quote from Jim Crouch on the proper use of lexicons explains how the experts, quote unquote, can easily be misrepresented, particularly in the verses under consideration. Lexicographers do not delineate the meanings of verbs in all tenses and moods, Crouch says. They present the basic definition of the word and then show how it is used within various contexts. That's why Thayer or Liddell or Gingrich can say that the meaning of kamao is to have or wear long hair. Rick Cutter and others can say, but it does not say to continually grow long hair. That's true. It's because this is emphasized by the tense and mood of the verb, it is not inherent in the verb's definition. I believe this is an important point to stress. Many people are unwittingly led down the wrong road in their use of Greek lexicons because one, they don't know how to use them properly, and two, though they may come up with the proper definition, they do not know how to properly apply that definition to a specific context because they know nothing about Greek grammar. This is especially true in respect to Greek verbs. Looking at the basic definition of a word, as illustrated above, is one step in the multi-step process of finding the proper definition of a Greek word used in a specific Bible verse. You might compare all of this to a foreigner who listens to a crude recipe for making waffles. He might think, wow, waffles are just a bunch of eggs, flour, and milk thrown together. I don't think I want any of that. But after he sees the finished product, pours on some warm syrup, and bites in, his appreciation for waffles is delightfully transformed. Like so, the basic definition of a Greek word contains a crude recipe. Cook, add syrup, and voila, the definition takes on a new shade of meaning, if you will. Question 8. If Paul is teaching that men must have cut hair and women must have uncut hair, then why do all the experts who write commentary say otherwise? Are we to assume all the experts are wrong in these verses? The term experts here is used very generically and very freely. The vocabulary in this particular question that's often asked is carefully chosen to sway the hearts of people by using a term that will catch their attention. There are many commentators, there are many writers who have been well studied in philosophy and theology and Greek and Hebrew and other special biblical studies and they do take a different position than what I'm presenting here in 1 Corinthians 11. But that doesn't mean they're right automatically. The same experts, or many of the same experts at least, will say that man doesn't have to be baptized for remission of sins, even though Peter said that exactly in Acts 2.38, be baptized for the remission of sins. They'll also say that an elder of the church doesn't have to have a wife or children, even though Paul said in Titus chapter 1 and verse 6, if a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, and he goes on, that kind of man can be an elder of the church. They also say that, Women can speak in the assemblies of the church, even though Paul specifically said, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for I don't permit them to speak. 
uh, they could go on and give examples of how those same experts talk about how you can use multiple cups and multiple loaves in the Lord's Supper, even though they'll agree and admit to the fact that in every account of observance of the Lord's Supper in the New Testament, Jesus used one cup and one loaf. And so you see how just because some of the quote-unquote experts say that a woman can cut her hair, that doesn't mean that you should hang your hat on it by that evidence alone. Furthermore, there are plenty of writers, well-studied, uh, who have written books and articles and so forth that take the same position that I'm presenting to you today. Again, that doesn't make the position right, but if you need to know that I'm not the only one holding this position, then there is that fact of solace. Question 9. Is Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 11 verses 2 through 16 directed to men and women generally or to husbands and wives? This is where the English Standard Version translators show their bias in this whole discussion. Whenever the word woman occurs in 1 Corinthians 11 verses 2 through 16, they've translated it wife, and without any good reason. You can see that when comparing it with all the other English translations. But this discussion about man and woman, you have to remember, going back to verse 3, and then also considering verses 7 through 12, that places the foundation of this discussion on the chain of authority. And that chain of authority, again, is God the Father is at the top, Christ always submits to the Father without exception. Under Christ is the man. He always, without exception, submits to Christ, whether he's a husband or not. And then below that, the wife, or, or in this case, woman, she always submits to man, regardless of if she's a wife or not. There is no reason to be translating the word woman specifically as wife there. Now, Paul also says in verse 8, he says, For man is not from woman, but woman from man. That means that every man has gone through the birth canal, not just those who are currently husbands. He also says a parallel sentiment to the woman in verse 9 to show things that are common to all women, women whether they're married or unmarried. And so this concept, although it's the answer I just gave you and the answer from Paul is not agreeable to our culture, whether that's secular culture or whether that's the modern innovative evangelical world today that calls himself Christianity, it's not favorable to either one, but we have to remember to be true to the Word of God always when answering this question or really any of these ten questions. Question 10. What do angels have anything to do with what Paul is talking about? First Corinthians 11 verse 10 says, For this reason the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. The best we can do to interpret because of the angels here is to use context clues. We know very little about the history of angels in eternity past besides the fact that they were created by God according to Psalms 104 and verse 4, and some were cast out of the presence of God according to Peter. In 2 Peter 2 and verse 4 he says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness. And he goes on, From this we do know that those cast out of heaven rebelled against God. And in 1 Corinthians 11 verses 2 through 16, Paul is talking about submission to authority. Again, see verses 3 and 7 through 12. The most logical conclusion seems to be that God assigned long uncut hair as a symbol to the woman, a symbol of submission to the man God placed over her. Whenever the woman cares for her glorious hair, she is reminded of her submission to man and in turn God. Whenever she is tempted to cut her hair, she is reminded why she is letting it on growing because of what happened to the angels. If this interpretation is wrong, we don't know of any other interpretation which better harmonizes the immediate context of these verses in 1 Corinthians 11 with what the Bible reveals about the history and nature of angels. Well, that puts a wrap on our study of the frequently asked questions from 1 Corinthians 11, verses 2 through 16. What I would encourage you to do from here is to take your Bible, read these passages, again, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 2 through 16, and meditate on those verses that we talked about specifically, verses 4, 5, 14, and 15. Those are the passages where most of the controversy revolves in the discussion of the hair. If I've left you with any kind of doubt about anything, maybe something that you previously believed on these verses or the subject, I would encourage you to, after you take those passages and read them, go back and watch this video all over again pay attention to those particular issues where you had difficulty. If you have any questions from there, then contact me and I'll do my best to answer 
those questions with honesty and integrity as best as I can. Don't forget to share this video and then follow and subscribe the YouTube channel 5-Minute Bible Study. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Thanks for watching.